Hello, everybody. It's a rainy evening in Bangkok, but it's Wednesday, which means it's time for another episode of Field Gemology Talks. My name is Justin K. Prim. I will be one of your hosts tonight. We are going to be talking to Nirin Rokosana about Madagascar and all the beautiful rubies and sapphires that we have glanced upon or, or, or briefly spoke upon with some of our previous guests, but we're going to go even deeper tonight. So if you guys haven't been with us before, we have now been doing this for, I guess, let's see, 12 weeks. This is our 12th week, maybe our 11th week, 11th or 12th week of doing this series. And as you can see by all of the awesome guests that we've had so far, we've had so many good conversations that are all now up on YouTube. So if you guys missed one, or maybe this is your first time with us, definitely go back if you're interested and see some of these other talks, we've really been all over the world at this point. Um, and Africa has been one of our favorite spots really to talk about. Many, many stories, many adventures, many guests coming from various parts of Africa. And tonight we're gonna to be going even further. So Vincent, if you're ready, we can uh, kick it off. Yeah, hello everybody. Good evening. How are you? Yeah, everything is fine. Everything is fine. You know, it was a, a busy day uh, working with uh, Ruby from Greenland. Um, checking the production now, there was some heating. So I was uh, checking a little bit the quality of the, of the heating of the rubies. So it was interesting. And uh, yeah, as you say, you know, here, <coughs> situation is uh, quite uh, well under control. There is a uh, uh, people are going to work with masks and they clean their hand and uh, so far, except a few people coming from outside, uh, like this day, uh, some diplomat uh, that don't uh, follow the, the, the regulation, there is uh, still uh, no case, uh, you know, internal case in Thailand. So it's, uh, it's uh, kind of uh, okay here. Yeah, so, so far, so good. You know, still, well, we cannot uh, travel. We are blocked here. And, uh, uh, I think that uh, sadly there is a lot of uh, the issue is uh, far to be uh, from uh, under control in the rest of the world. So, you know, I hope that everything, uh, everybody is fine. Uh, you know, uh, I see that you have people from a bit everywhere who are watching us. Yeah. And uh, I hope that everybody is careful and uh, will be fine and uh, we'll be able to see each other again uh, soon when uh, I will start to travel again, which I'm getting a little bit itchy about. Yeah, I know what you mean. So, yeah, so tonight we are going to travel a little bit because we are going to uh, to speak with an old friend of mine. And uh, maybe uh, you can, maybe, I don't know if Niren is around. Yeah, Niren, if you're ready, um, come on in. You can start your video and we'll do a little bit of story hour here and see we got we got a lot of photos lined up for you guys and some good stories and and some interesting stuff um Niren, if you click on mute vincent you're muted as well somehow i don't know if that was my fault <laughs> hello okay hello so i'm on mute yes we're good yeah um, yeah we can hear you okay Welcome. So as they say, you know, Nirin is an old friend. Uh, actually, I met Nirin uh, during my first visit in Madagascar in 2005. Uh, it was a kind of a big experience. Uh, when I first visited, I was not able uh, to meet Nirin. I first visited Madagascar in uh, June, in June 2005. And at this time, I was not able to meet Nirin because he was busy somewhere. And when I returned to Madagascar two months later, I was with uh, Richard Hughes on the Dana Shore, and uh, we went to visit uh, Nirin uh, operation that was very impressive. That was in uh, Sakam Milk. And uh, Nirin was staying actually in the same hotel as us. And so I remember that uh, Nirin and uh, the owner of the hotel took us uh, one evening to uh, uh, Ilakak to visit Ilakak by night, and uh, we spent the night in a uh, there was a kind of big party, and uh, that was kind of uh, wise stuff. 
And the next day, you know, we return to uh, visit mining areas. And since then, every time I go to uh, Madagascar, uh, we remain in contact and uh, we, we meet each other and I can follow, uh, you know, uh, nearing uh, mining adventure because he's one of the few characters that uh, I met among the people I met, you know, visiting mining area, I think that very few people reach the level of passion about mining that uh, I see in uh, in Nirin. So he's one of the most passionate miners that I know, and also one of the most knowledgeable because he has a, a serious background. Many people sometimes they think that miners, you know, in a gem producing countries in Africa are not very well educated, but I can tell you, Nirina regarding degree has a higher degree of uh, university degree than me because he has uh, an engineer degree that I don't have. So he studied one more year in university in France compared to me, but he is mining. <laughs> so he is probably one of the most um, uh, qualified and uh, uh, qualified miner I know. Yeah, sure. Plus 20 years of experience. Wow. So I'm very happy that he accepted to uh, to speak with us. And uh, we have a lot of questions for him. And I guess that uh, you also, uh, the people who are listening to us, will have the, the chance to be able to ask him a few questions. So thanks, Nirin, to have accepted our invitation. And uh, we welcome. are super happy to welcome you. Thanks. You're welcome. So I guess our traditional beginning of the show question is just to kind of get a little bit of background about you so we can kind of understand where you're coming from. So maybe let's start with when you first arrived in Ilikak and what, what was your story behind that? How did you, how did you find yourself there? Yes, uh, well, <laughs> I arrived in Ilikak at the very beginning of the rush. It was in, uh, I guess, I remember it was October the 12th or the 13th in 1998. It was just the beginning. And well, I knew nothing about Sapphire, but I just heard about this rush and wanted to, <laughs> to have a look. So when I just arrived, I saw a lot of uh, small stones, pink and blue and a lot of people digging everywhere. And that's it. That was the beginning. And how, so 1998, so are you still there now? Is that where you're mainly located out of? Like how long do, have you been there since 1998? Oh, I've been staying here for more than, uh, I guess, 16 years now mining in uh, Iraq. Uh, well, first I had, uh, I worked with uh, diggers, artisanal mining. It was at the, just at the very beginning. We had about 300, 350 diggers working with us at the beginning, but that was, well, it was, it was easy at the, in that time. And then after three, four, six months, I get well, I get bored with uh, <laughs> working in the diggers. There was so many problems with them, so I stopped working in the big with the diggers and tried to launch a new mining operation. But it was not uh, well; it wasn't easier at the beginning. Mm -hmm. In 2000, I launched my own mining operation and it lasted, on, I think it lasted only, well, 12 months after 13 months. It was a complete failure. <laughs> oh. We knew nothing about mining. We knew, we didn't know the, the, the deposit and uh, we didn't know about the earth moving equipment. So, after one year, we lo I lost everything. <laughs> it was right. a complete, well, trying to say fiasco. It was really <laughs> a disaster. <laughs> but I'm guessing since then you've 
turned it around? You've started something new or? Yeah, I hung around uh, Ilac for two, three years. Well, I, I didn't want to, to give up mining actually, uh, but I want to, to learn from my, uh, my mistakes. And uh, yes, I stayed here for three years, two, three years, and I resumed mining in uh, 2005. My idea was that, uh, well, the thing is, I understood from what I did, the mistakes that, uh, well, why I I will make it so 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 badly. So when I resumed mining, it was uh, a little bit easier. Okay, and that and was when I met you. That was uh, when you uh, yeah. mining in two thousand and five. You went in. Uh, you were mining in Saka Milk. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. It was in Saka Milk. Well, the place where you were working and then you fell. Where was it exactly? Which one? The place where you were working for one year and you tried and you first did your mining and then it was a disaster. Oh, it was, uh, okay, it was in women. Um, oh, it was well, in women. I think it's, yeah, that was in women, the first place. Well, the thing is, when you began my, I began mining, we thought, we thought it should be something very easy because you see the, the diggers, the way they they get stones, they get well. They issue gravel. What the thing you have to understand is that um, Ilakak is an uh, alluvial deposit, and uh, the jamberin, the gravel is the stones are in the jamberin gravel uh, the, the, in the gravel. So you have to get the gravel, wash sieve and screen the gravel to remove the to remove the stone from the from the gravel and when you you see the the diggers working from one cubic meter and or two cubic meter of gravel they can get as much as 200 grams of stone and then you say oh that that's really easy if i use earth mode in equipment i get hundreds cubic meter of gravel so you start making financial <laughs> and projection, projections and you say, wow, <laughs> that's easy, but it's not that easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So because a... actually you have to remove also the overburden of, and in some place you have gravel where you have no stones. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, that's, that's the whole story, actually. Uh, diggers have the... Uh, they have their experience. They know what to get the gravel and they know what gravel to take. When you are making mechanized mining, you have to remove 20, 30 meters of a burden, of a burden and you have to wash everything you get. So if the yield in uh, artisanal mining is about from 80 gram to 120 gram per cubic meter, the yield in uh, mechanized mining is around 1, 1.5 gram per cubic meter. So there is a huge difference between wow. what you get from mechanized mining and uh, artisanal mining. That's because that makes artisanal all... mining are they are digging a, a small uh, pit and then they are going to reach a gravel and then they collect only the gravel. But mechanized mining, you have to mine everything. You are doing a, a, an open uh, open cast, an open pit, correct? Yeah, the, well, actually the key issue in, uh, in Ilakak is uh, overburden. Mm. The uh, overburden is sometimes as thick as 55, 50, 60, uh, 66, 65 meters, that means 200 feet. And when diggers make a pit, a small pit to go to the gravel, well, it takes time, but the cost is not is not different from from twenty to fifty or sixty meters, but in uh, mechanized mining, when you remove ten meters of uh, of a burden, 
compared to 30 meters of, of a burden, it's not the same story. It's four times, six times the cost of the mining cost is six times higher when you remove 30, 30 meters of, of, of a burden. And that's the key issue in, uh, in Ilakak mining. Mm -hmm. Justice, maybe can you show some photograph of the pit? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so people can imagine what overburden means. Okay. Like uh, the pit it uh, on sous with the excavator inside. That would be fun. Okay. So. Actually, overburden is the sand you have to remove because the the gravel is underneath no. 20, 30 meters that's of uh, sand. No, that's a washing plant. You want to see like this one? Yeah, that's okay. That's a washing plant. Yeah. But, but the, the one yeah, with the yeah. excavator yeah, down, you the you yellow, can see on this. The yeah, photo, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. You can see on this picture. You see at the background, this uh, all these damper track. They are removing. They are taking the the outer burden, and the 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 gravel, the jam bearing gravel, is still maybe ten to fifteen meters under under this uh, level of uh, working this working level. So you have to remove all this sand in order to get to the other burden. And that's, well, that's pricey. It's yeah. That's your mine pricey. in uh, Sakamel. This is where I that met you. That was in my mine in Sakamel, yeah. Yeah, in 2005. And then you guys want to see this one. Yep, that's the one. So that's in uh, Ansu on the Thais River. And this place you were mining at uh, 35 meter to reach a gravel, correct? Yeah, yeah. But when we we, did, we changed the, our mining techniques because the the tracks were using damper tracks was so expensive. Then uh, in 2000 and that was in 2008, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we bought some some conveyor belts in uh, in China. We built the, well. Actually, we didn't bought the conveyor belt, the complete conveyor belt, but we bought some small some parts in China, and we built all these conveyor belts in uh, in Ilakak. We had about uh, 500 meters of con this conveyor belt. And so this was a and question from the audience. It was removed. The stripping of other burden was well. We reduced our our prices by well. 30, 50 percent of the mining cost was reduced. Mm. One one person in the audience had asked, "Why is the the yield so different? Is it purely just from overburden, or is there is there other factors as well between artisanal and and you know the this kind of bigger?" Yeah. What you, you can see on these photos that uh, on the, these pictures that uh, well we are going 30, 35 meters down, but the thing is we are mining in areas that has already been mined, but um, but uh, but by diggers. Okay. That is to say, we are taking the gravel that has been left by the the, the diggers. They take maybe 40 or to 60 percent of the gravel. And one thing on, on the uh, one other thing is that uh, they know where the traps, when you are underground, they know where the traps are. So they 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 take the best gravel from the from the from the layers, and we are taking what they what they leave so mm. this is why well, this is why the the value on the quantity of stones are well less mm. much less than what they get i mean the yield is less than what the diggers get yeah just thing because the thing is small scale miners the diggers they you have maybe 20 people digging random if one guy found a stone, find a good concentration of stone, everybody will come around. So they dig one vertical pit, and then they reach the gravel, they collect the gravel. They don't do like Nearing was doing a big open pit. So they go from area of high concentration to area of high concentration. When you do mechanized mining, when you do mechanized mining, 
you start with a channel and then you follow the channel. So you mine everything. If there is an area with high concentration, an area with low concentration, you advance, you mine everything. So the yield is much lower. That's really wild. That's, uh, that's the whole story, actually. That's correct. And yeah, so that's the story you told me. <laughs> I understood that when you told me <laughs> in Ensu, because you were telling me that you were using the small scale miners as a kind of prospectors. But then you find out that when the prospectors have finished prospecting, there was nearly no more stones. <laughs> and so somebody asked, I guess um, they're, well, they're asking, are all these photos from Madagascar, which I'll say, yes, they are. But yeah. um, they were surprised to see that there, are, there is a large scale mining operation going on there. Is this No, rare? it's not now. It's okay. not now. It but was nearly <laughs> 2005 or 2008. Everything is over. <laughs> So is, is actually, the, I, I, I had this large, very large mining operation from 2005 to 2009. Well, thing is, we began with very few equipments in 2005, and uh, we, well, we had, we get lucky. Well lucky and we tried to to favorize this luck uh, we worked on a very easy spot for six four, four months six months uh, it was a place where there are there were only four or five meters of uh, of a burden to, to remove so we could with very few equipment we could work for four or five months and get very good production from from this part. And so is this then we could buy more equipment. Okay. And this well, these are all this equipment we can see on these pictures, on these uh, pictures and you showed previously. Yeah. And so was was your operation the only large scale operation that that Madagascar has ever seen is every is literally everything else just small artisanal mining style. Well, no, actually, we, at just at the beginning of the the rush, there were three three Thai companies, and two or three well, two Sri Lankan companies uh, have launched but launched. Um, Mechanized mining, but they didn't. Well, no, we didn't know the. They didn't know the deposit, and they were for let's say one year, less than one year, and then they stopped mm. because uh, well, it's not that easy. And there is one thing. Well, there are things that I understood later on, and this is why. I could succeed to make mining from 2005 and 2008 or 2009. Well, actually, it was a good business from 2005 and 2008, but we began losing money from 2008 to August 2009 when I definitely closed the mine. Okay. And so uh, between, you know, your company and the other companies you were speaking about, are these mostly private individuals or groups or bigger, bigger, you know, more, more financially profitable or uh, backed groups? Well, the Thai companies were private, were private people, big company, well, some big company from, from Thailand. Mm -hmm. They had the equipment, they had the knowledge, they had the money. But they didn't have the knowledge of the of the land. Mm. Yeah. yeah, because well, it's not. There is one thing: removing the other burden, getting the gravel. But you have to get. Well, you have to to wash the correct gravel. You don't have to wash everything. Mm. So this we learned uh, when when he, with the experience. But at the beginning, no one knew. Okay. You see, you have to understand that the Thais, they had experienced mining rubies at the border between Thailand and Cambodia. 
or mining sapphire, for example, there was a company called SAP who was mining in Kanchanaburi. So they were mining basalt related sapphire, very, very young deposit, less than 1 million years. In uh, Thailand, when you, you have some overburden, but then you have one layer of stone. The deposit in Hilakak is much older, and it's a secondary deposit of secondary deposit of secondary deposit. So in Hilakak, sometimes you have eight, nine, 10, or 11 layers of gravel. And each layer have a different, some, a different composition. Some layers have zero sapphire. Some layers have only blue, big blue. Some layers have uh, small pink and yellow. So every layer is kind of different. So when you are mining in Ilakak, people came with their knowledge of Thailand, a basalt related deposit. And then they arrived in Ilakak and they were thinking it was the same. It's not the same. Okay. It's absolutely not the same. Because the Ilakak is in sandstone. It's paleo channel of paleo channel of paleo channel in sandstone. It's very different from what you have in Thailand, and it's also different from what you have in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So the models then, that you have in Sri Lanka or in Thailand are not really applicable in most of the places in Ilakak. In one or two places where you have only you know, a shallow deposit and you have only one layer of gravel over a bedrock, it's okay. But in many other places, you have multiple layers and yeah. they are not even. And we can, so it's actually and you, very you have also another issue, okay? Yeah. You have also another issue. Uh, that is, in Ilakak, most than well, some other place, this uh, the there is uh, this is a random a random distribution, so you cannot smooth your production. If you want to smooth your production, you have to, under, to understand many things. I mean, you have to. This is the thing I understood when I uh, started mining for three years. You have to make. You have to wash big quantities of gravel, and you have to wash the good gravel. These these are the two combinations of the two factors that you can help you make your mining operation profitable or lose. Somewhere is not very far from. If you go back to another webinar that we did with Cedric Simone, and he explained the random distribution of evaporite on the surface when you are looking at savorite on one layer. So you have one layer where you have evaporite and basically savorite will crystallize in this evaporite. In Ilakak, it's about the same. So you have a, a riverbed and in, in this riverbed, there are some area where you will have a sapphire trap, some area where there will not be sapphire trap. So when you are working on one layer, that is a paleo channel, a former riverbed, some areas you will find sapphire that will be trapped and maybe for 20 meters there will be nothing and then again a trap big or small uh, maybe wide maybe deep don't know depending of how was the the bottom of the river yeah. at that time maybe 400 million years ago or 30 million years ago or 200 million years ago and Vincent, somebody asked, how old is the Ilakak deposit in millions? Well, of like all East Africa, all East Africa, I think in Sri Lanka, this sapphire form about 500, 600 million years old. So you had five or 600 million years of uh, rock destruction, concentration, redestruction, reconcentration. The whole area, the whole Ilakak, is about 120 kilometers by 120 kilometers with sandstone. So it's an old area where you find a sapphire deposit basically randomly on former riverbed that doesn't really, that are not really connected with the current riverbed that are very young. So you have to find out where was the river 20 million years ago 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago, 300 million years ago. So the deposits were destroyed 
maybe 400 million years ago, and during the past uh, few hundred million years, everything was move and move again and move again. And so if we go back to this picture, this was a question from the audience. If we go back to this picture, Niren, um, they're wanting to know how deep was the first gravel bed that you guys had to, to get down to? In this picture, the, the, the bedrock is about uh, 35 meters uh, uh, from the, the top of the, the soil. Okay. The first the first layer of gravel is about uh, 28, 29 meters, but this gravel wasn't, uh, wasn't very good. The best one is between the, the, the last layer, the, the deepest layer. Actually, the, the best one is above, just above the, the deepest layer of gravel. Okay, and so is the gravel bed layers this darker, the darker soil? Like in no. this one right here? No, that's the first no, one. No, it's just uh, the other button. No, no. It's just oh, the color of the button. Not okay. the you can't see yeah. the gravel for me. No. And, and there are deeper. And, and he can go deeper, uh, Justin. He can go deeper. Last yeah. time we went with Nirin, because this pit still exists. And now you have uh, small scale miners that are digging from the bottom of uh, Nirin pit, okay. and they are going even deeper. So you helped them out a little bit. Yeah, there is still, in, uh, in Inakak, you have some pits that are 65 meters deep. And uh, you, you can meet, for example, the first layer of gravel at 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters. But then you may have another one, uh, another good one, 10 meters deeper, and then another one, and then another one. In yeah. some place, you have probably more than uh, 100 or 200 meters of salt, of, uh, of uh, sandstone. Mm -hmm. about 200 meter vertical of uh, sandstone. But then you have the water table where people then it's become very difficult to mine because you reach the layer of the water. Yeah, okay, then you're gonna need pumps and stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, aside from Elacock, have you mined in other, pl other areas around Madagascar? Yes, yes, when I left in Elacock, when I uh, stopped mining in 2009, I went to my, I went mining in uh, Andrandam. It's a, a, sapphire, a sapphire deposit in the south of Madagascar, in the outback of <laughs> nowhere. It's uh, it's a primary, it's a primary deposit, blue sapphire. Very nice blue sapphire, huge deposit. That was it was very famous in ninety nine, I think ninety three or ninety four. Yeah, correct. And well, very, very dry area. This is this is the place where we mined that the in 2010, 2010. And so this looks and, like a totally different type of terrain. You know, it just even the colors are totally different. Yeah, it's in a scar. It's a it's a high. Uh, uh, it's a rock that is a type of rock that is very hard, very hard because you had a magmatic intrusion that went uh, through uh, some uh, metamorphic rock and this rock went nearly to the melting point and uh, as a result you have this uh, super uh, hard uh, uh, rock that is people can only dig when you go down, you, it's very difficult to dig uh, uh, with the hand tool horizontally. So what people do in Ilakak, you cannot do there. Mm. You can only dig vertical. Okay. Yeah, you cannot make tunnel. You just no. make vertical uh, pit and, uh, well, <laughs> dig as a work in very tough If you're condition. lucky, there might be a pocket under you, but if there is no lucky, if there is no luck, you can mine, uh, you dig uh, 30 or 40 meters and you get nothing. Yeah. And again, this is a complete random distribution because there is no cue, there is no, there is no clue to, to go that tells you why is the pocket. But when you eat the pocket, well, that's jackpot. <laughs> you, Niren, you remember when uh, we went there to, uh, we, we went to visit you in 2011, I think, 
with uh, Richard and Billy on that trip we had, you introduced us to one guy. There were, there were two or three guys who were mining there for about 20 years and they never hit any pocket. They, they never found anything and everybody was laughing about them, laughing about them. But one of the guys, like a few weeks before our visit, he hit that pocket with uh, this uh, kind of uh, milky stone, about 200 kilos, and he became suddenly a rich guy and nobody was laughing anymore about him. But it took him 20 years to find one pocket. Wow. <laughs> and so we can see um, That's true. some of the stones, yeah. how they look. What's the what's the host rock that this blue sapphire is coming out of? Pyroxenite, I guess. I don't know the name in uh, in English. Pyroxenite. Okay. You know, it, it's a scarn. We, and within this scarn, you have a kind of pockets that are with. Uh, you may have a calcite and then pyroxene and then mica, and then inside you have a kaolin associated with also uh, graphite. And then you have the pocket, uh, the sapphire inside the kaolin with the graphite. Okay. So you, it's a, you know, basically pyroxene plus mica. You don't have mica, you don't have sapphire. You don't have pyroxene, you don't have sapphires. So you need uh, everything. And then inside, maybe in some case you have sapphire, but nine times on ten, you don't have sapphire. You have sapphire only once on ten. Okay. And so it's uh, kind of random. But sometimes you have stone. You may have a uh, thirty big stone in one pocket. And somebody had asked which areas are the fields. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which area is producing the best quality sapphires? I guess right now, you know. Well, if you're talking about uh, blue sapphires, it's in from Andran Dump. But okay. Dam Dam produces this only blue sapphire. Okay. If you're yeah. talking about uh, pink sapphire, yellow sapphire, white sapphire, you Best, uh, best the spot is uh, Ilakak. Ilakak yeah. produces pink, most Apple pink suffice, and some very, very nice blue. Yeah. Okay. And again, after uh, after Anjan Dump, I went to Andilamen, in a place called uh, the called uh, Saide, yeah. the yeah. Garden of uh, <laughs> Eden. Eden Garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good place. Yeah, yeah and I again, that's that totally uh, different terrain because Ilakak is uh, Ilakak. Yeah, this is uh, Andi Lamen. Andi Lamen is in the the hills in the north or east of the country, and it's covered by forest, so it's raining all the time. So it's wet forest covered hills full of mud everywhere, and to go there <laughs> you need to. Nearing the place where you were going, how many days walking from Andy Lamen to go to your mine? Three, huh? at your speed. No, 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 not three. It's, uh, uh, six, well, two, two hours of uh, bike, five hours of uh, walking, three, three hours of uh, boat on, on, the, on, the, on the boat. And then six hours uh, walking again. Yes. That was side in. And this on this picture is um, uh, on Dilamen. Yes. Main production yeah. is uh, ruby. Yeah. Okay. Not very nice ruby, but rubies in tons and tons and well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's Andy Lamen in uh, 2000. And by the way, the first uh, mention of Andy Lamen in 2000, uh, in 2000 was an article written by you. With, because you went there in 2000 and uh, you informed Alex uh, Lohenberger and Alex submitted an article to uh, German Gemology. So the first reference on Andy Lamen in a magazine, basically you went there, so Nirin went there, and then uh, work with Alex Lohenberger and you send some uh, photographs. And that was the first time I read an article about uh, Andy Lamen. That was the first time I saw your name somewhere on the paper. But oh. uh, he was a kind of a secret, uh, secret guy who was going there. So this is Andy Lamen, yes. This is, uh, at this time, that was in 2005, you had about maybe 5,000. At this time I was thinking 15,000 because people were telling me 15,000. But after counting the house, you know, with a satellite photograph, 
with the help of Remy Canavesio that was our guest in a former webinar, now we think that actually it was closer to 5,000 people when I was there and not the 15,000 people that the gossip was about. Mm -hmm. So maybe 5,000 people. 5,000 people in a, in a forest uh, corridor, it's already a lot of people. Yeah. And so and the, the, you have the photo just after that show will be the, the rubies that you had. Or well, you show it uh, briefly just before. Yes. That's the production in uh, Andy Lamen. So you can see just with, you know, these uh, photos uh, and uh, based on a uh, near experience that the south of Ilakak produce all type of colors for sapphires then uh, in Ilakak. Then Andrew Landon produce only blue sapphire and Andy Lamen produce mainly this uh, uh, rubies, red color. That was the material that was used most at the beginning for the leg dust treatment, the base material. So these stones are mainly clean, but they have fracture. And uh, with the leg dust treatment, they are filling the fracture with leg dust. And then you get some uh, big stone that uh, are looking like uh, big and clean, but actually they are still full of fractures. Mm. Are there some localities that are producing Padparaja colors? Yeah. Ilaka <laughs> produced Padparaja colors. <laughs> and, uh, and the next one where Nirin was working, indeed, is also producing uh, orangey like colors. And Ilamen is producing also uh, all pink orangey type colors. Yes. So then, where, so what other places have you done mining, Nirin? Well, from uh, Dilamen, well, <laughs> it, there was this rush indeed. <laughs> it is a, a really weird place because that was it. there were really, well, that's the picture. Did, that was did. The, this place was not, well, was as big as a, uh, uh, or soccer field, but there were more than 2,000 people working on the same same area in this small area. And wow, <laughs> it was really uh, an experience that <laughs> I lived in did. I remember at this time you were mining in Andilame and then all your miner left to go to Deed, so you had to go to Deed also, because yeah, you are not anymore to, working yeah, with I you. I didn't want to go there, actually. <laughs> but all the diggers, well, they, they said, "Oh, we don't want to. We don't want to stay in uh, on Dilamen. There is a big rush. They people find very nice blue stones and rubies, and we don't want to stay here. So." All the diggers moved to to Dean and I had to follow the, the, the diggers. So this is what, how I came to to Did. But when I came to Did, actually, it, well, it was I arrived a little bit late because it wasn't the the, the 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 good place, the good area wasn't very as I told you, it's as big as a, a soccer field. It wasn't that big. Okay. And it was mined up in uh, two, three weeks. And the thing is, uh, when I arrived there, we tried to to make some exploration on the, um, around this area because there were too much, so many people in this area that uh, we couldn't find a place what to, to to work on. And we tried to make some exploration, and there was well. We didn't find crowd anywhere, anywhere, else, anywhere else. So, at some point, I said, "Okay, there is something I have to do because we spend a lot of money working there." And and there was a, a lady, an old lady that has a small hut, a small house, a very small house, like what we see in the um, on the on this uh, on this picture. So. I tried to 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 sell the, the to to buy this house from this lady. I bought it from well, let's say, not wasn't very expensive. And then we worked under the house, and we got one very nice <laughs> one very nice stone. You do you remember this stone, Vincent? 
it was a seven, uh, seven gram one, 30, 38 carat stone, very clean, very nice. But the thing is, there was, it was a red with blue. So you, do, do you remember the stone? It was, wow. Yeah, the stone but, is on a photo in my article. I put yeah, the stone yeah. in photograph in my article. I was, I, you show me the stone. I was able to take a good photo of it. And uh, it's in my yeah, report. I didn't hear website. the stone in Bangkok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw this story in Bangkok. Yes, so that was pure at this life. time you didn't. At this time you didn't wanted to uh, me to put that uh, the stone was coming from you, so I didn't put anything. <laughs> so if you're in a place like this where there's so many people all concentrated into one area, what is that experience like for you? Is it is it chaos or is everybody sort of working in some kind of a harmony? Well, there is no, no, there is no pressure. There is no threat. There is no, there is nothing. It's, uh, it's very, it's very cool. There is no, well, sometimes it happens that <laughs> there are some fights, but generally there is nothing. It's very quiet. In, in this place, like I did, and then later when I went to uh, Bement, it did, I could not go because uh, the police blockers. So actually, I had to give my camera to uh, Nirin. This photo was taken by Nirin. I gave my camera GPS to Nirin, so he he went there and he's the one who provided me all the information that you have in the in the report because the police didn't allow us to go except we were being bribed. But GA, uh, uh, there was a no bribe policy at GA. There is still a no bribe policy at GA, so we could not uh, give uh, money to the gendarme uh, and to the head of the village in order to go there. So that was not possible. Mm. So foreigners were not allowed to go, but Nirin was allowed to go. So Nirin went. But so I could not uh, go on site at this uh, at this rush. And I, I tell the whole story in the report. Mm. But in Bement later, where I was able to go, you know, when you reach a place where people find stone, they are happy. They are super motivated to dig and uh, it's uh, people have a great spirit. They see you, they're happy to see you. Oh, you're coming to see. Everybody thinks that probably maybe tomorrow or next week they will become rich. Okay, so it's a very optimistic environment. Yeah, and it's there is, you know, everybody has uh, is in high spirit about, uh, you know, getting something where it's much more difficult is when the rush is passed and there is no more stone. The people who were not able to find stone and they spend a lot of money or, or maybe they, you know, and they are going bankrupt. Then the mood is very different. Okay. When everybody who has all the winners at the lottery left, and then there is no more, uh, there is nothing remaining and people just remain with their debt. Yeah. And that's uh, a very different type of environment. Nirin can tell you about that. This is very difficult. So these are from these are some stones from from Deed. Yeah, Deed was uh, very special because you could find in the same place some uh, very uh, good uh, red stone and also some excellent blue one and also some uh, pinkish orange one as you can see on the top, mm -hmm. plus some stones that were pink purple by color like uh, in Madagascar they call polychrome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting place. So it seems like you've been mining in quite a few different places. Have you always been a miner or, or what were you doing? Were you doing something different before this? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was uh, at the beginning of my career, I was a civil servant. <laughs> I was working for government. Okay. For, Three years, but well, <laughs> that's what, another story. What, what about before? What about be, before before working for the government? What were you doing? No, after I graduated from uh, Toulouse, France, I was working for, for the government. I was a civil servant. <laughs> but you, you have which kind of background? You need a degree? Which kind of degree do you have? Yes, I am civil aviation uh, engineer from Toulouse, Ecole Nationale de l'Aviation Civile in France, and graduate, graduated from there. Yeah, this is one of the highest uh, engineer school in France. 
he graduated. Yeah. Most of the people are thinking that minors have no education and blah, 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 blah. Neri have a higher level of education than me. <laughs> he has a... <laughs> That doesn't change anything. <laughs> well, no, but some people think that, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, miners in place like Madagascar, Tanzania, you know, local miners have no education and blah, 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 blah. What I see, and which is very interesting, is that when there is a, a rush like in, uh, in Idakak, it attracts people with from all different type of profession. You can go, you, you see an engineer, you see a doctor, you see a former policeman, you see a former politician. You have people with totally different background who go there. Some succeed, some fail, some get the, the, the bug, the mining bug, some don't. But you have people with a, a very good level of education that go to uh, become gem miners. It's all a bit like the gold rush in California, in the Yukon. You have the whole society is uh, can be found there. Okay, so let let's go to there's a while we were talking out there's a whole lot of questions that just came up. Um, someone had asked, is the government very strict there with the environmental laws and like sort of sustainability requirements, or is it pretty much open game? Well, if you want to to set up a, a mechanism mining, you have to feel to fulfill a lot of the engagement, uh, environmental, cahier uh, de charge. How do you say cahier de charge? I don't know. To yeah, you have a requirement, a lot of requirement. Yeah. yeah. So have to, normally you have to to respect this cahier uh, de charge. Otherwise, you cannot get the mining license and you can get the authorization of the mining. This is the, this is the law. Okay. But then uh, I, I'm guessing if you're a small scale miner, then maybe you don't need, to, you're, you're getting around this. Well, the fact is uh, all these people who are doing mining in Ilag, for example, in Ilag there are more than, I guess today, there are more than 30,000 people digging. But these are not well. They are they not. They are, don't have licenses, and they they are illegal miners. Okay. In, in regard of the in the in the eye of the in the law, but the, the law is one thing, and the the, the <laughs> on the field <laughs> that's another thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the practice is different. And so, but somebody... you, you have some people, Justin. You have some people who have a mining license. They have the license on the area, and they allow, they tolerate uh, people who are working there. So, they, it's not really that they are illegal. There is a legal mining license to work there, but the guy, the owner of the mining license, for example, don't want to mine with machine. And he will just uh, tell the people from the village to go there. So in this case, they are unlicensed. They are not really illegal because they are working on the license of somebody with the agreement of the, the license owner, but uh, they don't have a license themselves. So they are unlicensed. So, is so this... it, it depends if the owner of the license is okay with them. And in some case, like uh, the Sri Lanka, the owner of the license will provide some tools or will provide maybe some uh, bag of rice, something like that. So he will use the local labor. He will not pay salary, but he will say, well, you find the stone and then I buy the stone. Oh, okay. So there are different type of agreement in Madagascar. There are many different situations. And so in that specific situation, does that, is that a gray area or does that, is that legal or illegal or technically? I don't understand the question. Well, I, please, can you repeat the question, Justin? Yeah. Like, if 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 the owner if the owner of the uh, of the license is letting un other people come in to mine on their land, does that technically count as legal or illegal? As far as the government. That's concerned? legal. In this case, it's that's legal. legal. Okay. That's because the minor laws 
the 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 owner allows the miner to work on this uh, on this uh, license so it give it give gives them the the, the mining rights so it's legal in this case okay cool um somebody had asked you know talking about ilikak like uh do you think from your experience is there a sustainable life for the mine uh, for I mean, for the mining on a large scale, or does it need to just stay as a small scale operations? You mean a large mechanized mining yeah. operation? Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you think if they started doing everything with a large scale mechanized operation that they would have a long life or it would end quickly? Is there no way well, this is a huge deposit. You have, you have to understand that uh, this deposit is, um, well, it's from north to south, it's about 122 ki 20 kilometers. Yeah. And from west to east, it's about 80 kilometers. So that is, huge. it's far from being depleted. But I don't think that uh, there is, uh, there's a huge of a very large mining operation in uh, Ilakak for many reasons, but small scale mining is uh, still going on. Many diggers until now, and I think they will continue to, to work for, for years and years, mm -hmm. but big, big mechanized mining is uh, kind of, um, well, I don't know. We'll see in the future. Okay. Um, so if they don't know what they are doing, if they don't know what they are doing, like uh, some of them uh, who went there in the past, yeah. if they apply the wrong model, if they don't understand the geology, if they have the wrong uh, equipment, because they just have some equipment in Thailand and they move the equipment from Thailand there because they think that their equipment in Thailand will be perfect for Madagascar, probably not you have to adapt to the local geology and the local terrain. Yeah. One of the other problems in Madagascar is somewhere, even if there is a road in Ilakak, it's quite of remote. You, if you need spare parts from your equipment, you are on an island. And uh, when you order your spare part, maybe it will take uh, two weeks, three weeks, or one month to come. Mm. So this is one of the challenges uh, nearing that you had when you were working is uh, when you have some technical problem with your machine, they are, you have to be able to fix them. And sometimes your whole operation is stopped for one month or two months because your one of your machine broke and then you cannot repair it. Yeah, you have to set up a, uh, an organization, organization for, uh, well, for spare parts, for fuel, for everything, because you are in the outback, there is nothing. You have to bring everything from uh, from Tulia, from Bangkok. Otherwise, you have to pay a high price for spare parts if you had to buy these spare parts in Tana. But this is these are things that you can manage. But it's not the I don't see I don't see these things as, as a real issue. In, well, in mechanized mining. I think the main issue is that um, is, the, is this uh, other burden and the fact that um, a, a mechanized mining has to work on a place where diggers had removed maybe 60% of the good gravel. This is the main issue. Okay. And I don't from my experience, and I'm, I'm not eager to well to make the big mechanized mining as before because because of this issue, and this this issue remains. Whatever you do, what are the techniques that you are using in um, in your mining operation? So you have to go to new place. That's the point. A place where the no, no, no. individual miners uh, don't have work. But there is no new place. Imagine that we are we are digging in Ilakak for more than twenty two years, and there are there has been more than well eighty 
in the 10 years ago, there were 80,000 people digging every day, every single day, 80,000 people digging everywhere in this um, in deposit. So you have to understand that there is no, I don't think we'll find some new place. There will be some new find, sure. But for every new find, there will be 3,000 people coming in within two, two weeks and they will mine out everything in three months. So launching a very big mining operation in Ilaka is, uh, well, it's a big challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody, somebody had asked in the audience, in the, in the situation, I guess, where you have employees, you know, like for, I know a lot of people are just independent, but if, if you're a mining company there, like, like the one you had, where you actually have employees, how do the miners get paid? You know, are, are they partners or do they just get a salary or, or how does it work? Well, there is a difference between uh, hand mining and uh, mechanized mining. For mechanized mining, people get wages, salary, like uh, normal, normal people, people working for a private company. Mm -hmm. But for the, the hand mining, it's completely different because hand mining, there is a, well, let's say there is a patron who is feeding the people. I mean, they, they provide food, they provide the tools for, for mining, and they provide everything. They provide the, the, the trucks if the, people, if the diggers get sick or things like that. And when the, the diggers get the stone, the patron works as a, well, he's a, a middleman between the diggers who owns, well, the, 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 the stone be, belongs to the, to the diggers, but they are selling the stones either to the patron or to some Sri Lankan merchant. Okay. So the patron is in the middle, he's the middleman, and he's made, well, they share the, the, the value of the stone. And this depends, the, 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 the sharing of this uh, value depends on the agreement they had. Sometimes it's 30% for the patron, sometimes it's 50% for, for diggers and 50% for the, the patron, but they had an agreement and normally, well, but the one thing is that that is what they call a keep. So um, generally, the patron has an agreement with the um, with the buyer, so the buyer will keep some percentage, a big percentage of the, the value of the stone, and give the, this value to the to the to the patron. Okay. So well, it's not very fair because the the digger makes all the job, but in, but on the other hand. The patron, patron takes all the financial risks. So, well, <laughs> this is the way it works. Yeah. And, okay, we had a question from Alex. He says, do you think that increasing prices of good quality sapphire help to make the mining more profitable? You know, like, I mean, in terms of market prices, if the market prices go up for good quality sapphire, does that make it easier? For the people that are actually doing the mining, are we talking about uh, hand mining or mechanized mining? Because that's completely different. Well, I guess today, today I think that um, for good quality stones, the the price is really fair in Ilakek. For medium and low quality, the price is very, very low because there are a lot of stone on the market and well, people are speculating when they buy these stones. Mm -hmm. But for high quality stones, the price, price is fair. But it's complete, completely different, different when we are talking about uh, mechanized mining. From my experience, there is one thing that was completely missing is the uh, marketing size because I was working alone and I focused on mining. 
And when you focus on mining, you don't have time to, well, to, to give the best added value to our production. And what, that, that was a really a pitfall in my, my case, because, and in my case also, we were always buying some equipment and we need money all the time. So there was a, a, a lack of, uh, I would say, uh, working capital. So you have to sell the stone as soon as you get your stone. You have to, I want to 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 see the um, well, the Sri Lankan merchant and sell the stone, getting money to to run the to run the mine, and that was really well. If I had to to do the change things in the things, well, the the way I did the mining, I would change this part because. Uh, I didn't get the, the, the best added value to my production. Okay. So you said you've been there since 1998. That's a quite a long time. What have you seen change since you first arrived? Do you mean in Ilaka? Yeah, in Ilaka. Oh, <laughs> a lot of changes occurred in Ilaka. Well, the main thing is that, um, uh, the the easy to mine place area are already mined up. Yeah. This is finished, completely we, finished. Uh, the, at the beginning, when you had your kapok full of uh, sapphire and every sapphire that were left, yeah. the right, you were not even looking at it. That's gone. <laughs> <laughs> what? The, that was the golden days. It's over. It's completely finished. So the, the place was well, with uh, four or five meters or seven meters, less than 10 meters of, of, of a burden to remove. This completely finished, completely, definitely. There is no place, there is so, no such place today. So people have to go for deeper, deeper place, deeper gravel, and even for these places, the, there you very few virgin play very few virgin places and the people are coming back to places where they worked before because of uh well they are that uh, it was a good place and there was there are some crowd left there so they come back and try to get and but this is the big change so easy to mine places it's completely depleted, finished. And that, that is, well, combined with that is a decline in production. Since, well, I think five, six years now, there is a decline, a very, well, low production in Lakak. So that's, I think, the main changes. For one another changes is about the town. Ilakak is now a big town. Ilakak has 80,000 people, 80,000 inhabitants in Ilakak. So that's, that's an important thing. You, can, you, can, you cannot stop these things from today to tomorrow. It's, it's not possible. Ilakak will continue to live. People will continue to, to dig and to mine. But the, the conditions where, in, where these diggers are working are very well, difficult, very harsh. They are working in harsh con conditions. People, diggers are working with less than what, 1,500 area. That means less than 30 cents, 30 cents a day. You have to live with 30 cents a day, imagine. <laughs> Imagine the one kilogram of meat is about uh, four four dollar or three dollars, and you have to live with forty cents a day. Jeez. That's not well. Some diggers they have not seen meat for maybe four or five months. That's well, very tough working conditions. But that doesn't stop people from digging. Because I got the dream. I think, well, that's the main changes I see from then to now. Okay. Well, there is one thing also, I think that the, 
the price of uh, medium quality and low quality is very low. And I saw an increase of the, the price of very nice, nice stone. Price, price here are uh, very good. I think for very good quality, it's, uh, it's a good price locally. Okay. So you have told us already, you've mined like three or four different places around. How is the Illicoc deposit different from some of the other ones that you've seen? Uh, well, Illicoc is a, it's a huge deposit, very huge, very huge, very large mining area. Yeah. Here we can see the overhead view. Yeah, some pictures of uh, Ilakak. Uh, compare, I compare Ilakak to Andan Dam because Ilakak has a big potential, it still has a big potential from, for production. And I see also a very huge potential for production in, um, in Andan Dam. The big difference between Andandam and Ilakak is that Ilakak is on the way to the south. It's uh, near, it's close to the, all the dig, all the mining area are along the, the national road uh, seven, which is the main road from Antananarive to Tula. It's close to the national park. It's close to, well, you have, as I said before, Ilakak is a town now, so you have everything. It's easy to, to buy food. It's easy to, to provide diggers for food. That's not the case in, um, in Andrandam, Andrandam, even though Andrandam, I think that there is re real huge potential for, for Andrandam. The main difference uh, also between Andrandam and uh, Ilakak is that Ilakak is an uh, alluvial deposit. So as an uh, alluvial deposit, it's easier to get stones, not every day, but regularly. You can get stones regularly. Yeah. In Andrandam, you can work for years, months and years. And you, if you don't eat the pocket, you get nothing. Yeah, and it's really you. You are living in very tough conditions in the south, dry and very hot. So that's completely different. And Andandam is in the outback of. There's it's in the middle of nowhere. There is to go there from Antananarivo. It's three days uh, of dirt road. So that's completely different. You can't work. Difficult to work in Andandam, uh, even though there is a big potential. There are also big potential remaining in Andinamen, um, but the quality is not good. The buyers are not there. Buyers are in Ilakak, they are there. Quality of the stone is good. The market is demanding for blue sapphire and pink sapphire. That makes all the difference between Andandam, Ilakak, and uh, uh, on the domain. That's why well, that's the difference I see between these three areas where there are good potential for mining. And actually, on the domain is even more remote than uh, Andrew on the dam because Andrew on the dam you can go there by car. On the domain you cannot. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. And yeah. so before you were speaking about, you know, your experience with the mechanized mining and, and you said in the first few years it was going well, but then after that it, it didn't really didn't really do it didn't really profit anymore. And you spoke a little bit about you know just the cost of removing the overburden. Is that really the only reason why your mine your mining facility couldn't keep on going, or is was there many reasons for that? Well, you have to come back to the well the the whole story because. When I start after I stopped mining in 2000 and 2000 and 2001, 
I resumed mining in 2005, and from 2005 to 2007, we were doing very well. I mean, we understood that in order to get to make it profitable, you have to to smooth your production and understand. I understood also how to get this production to get the this smooth production. We, from the quantities of gravel we were washing, I, I can, I could predict, I could predict what quantity of, uh, what quantity of sapphire we are going to get from the, from the jigs. I could predict the quantity, not the, um, not the value, because the, the, the nuggets bias <laughs> always, <laughs> but you cannot, well, you cannot re rely on nuggets or I mean big size stone to to run your business operation. So from 2005 to 2007, price for medium size stones and mean small stones were quite good in Ilakek. So we could cover we could yeah, cover our mining costs more. Mostly with the uh, small size stone and medium size stone, so we could say that while well, the, the business model was that, well, okay, if we can cover the cost of uh, everything with the medium size stone and small size stone, then the, um, the big size stone was a bonus. Okay. But then, then in two thousand and seven, if you remember, the 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 price of the barrel of oil went well. It went to the to the level when it was skyrocketing. It was about one hundred fifty dollars the the barrel, and again it was very difficult for us to to cut the the costs of the mining. So I had to change the mining techniques. We were using lot of we using lot of uh, dumper trucks as well big dumper trucks to remove uh, the other burden. And what was the the, the prices? They're expensive. Mm -hmm. So in it was I think it was in uh, well it was in February in 2008. I went to China and we bought parts and we we built some some belt conveyors and we use belt conveyor to remove the other burden. So we, we could cut our mining costs by, or maybe we could reduce our mining costs by, by 40%. That was huge. You have to understand that removing this other burden costs about 60 to 70% of uh, or to, uh, total your total mining costs. So in 2008, we used these co conveyor belts and we reduced the price of the uh, our, our mining our mining operation. And then in 2008, <laughs> like this one. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's yeah. the conveyor belt. That that costs not. I mean, you have the, the investment is it's expensive, but the running cost is very low with uh, with this compared to the the truck. I guess this, that when you were when you were using this conveying belt, you were probably thinking about the mine you had uh, before in uh, Sakamel. And you were thinking, if I had that in Sacramento. <laughs> yeah, sure. Because when, I, when I had this conveyor belt, I, said, I was really relieved. And then I said, wow, it's, uh, well, I found the, the solution to all my problems. And, well, that's, that's who, where mining is, uh, well, it's uh, messy. Is that in, well, I think it was in, uh, July 2008, it, there was this uh, <laughs> a subprime mortgage crisis in the United States, and <laughs> all the prices for 
low quality, medium quality sapphires trapped. And we lost many, 80% of the value of the, the, the medium quality stones in Ilarek. Wow. From, from there, the mining was not, it wasn't profitable anymore. Okay. And then we, I continued I, to, to work from maybe, well, until August 2009. But we were losing money every single day of working in the mine. We tried to move from place to some other place and trying to, to, to look for better place and with bigger size stones, better quality stones. But, well, you cannot rely on big size stones to, to run and to, to make, uh, well, even to, to even out, to make, uh, to cover costs. It wasn't possible. That was really, I, I did this one year from July 2008 to August when I stopped in 2009. It was really uh, like a descent in, into hell, <laughs> really. We were suffering, losing money every day. But well, I couldn't, I couldn't decide to give up and stop the mining. Well, in the hindsight, as you can say that it was a big mistake. All my friends told me, you have to stop. Please stop. You are going well. But we moved from, to, from Sakamel. We went to Analala. We went to Ansu. We went to, I don't know, in any other place. Then, well, we have collected a lot of information about all this, uh, all these areas. We have gathered a lot of data that we he, we kept very well, painstakingly, very carefully. We know what gravel is good in, each, in which area. This is the, the quality of the gravel. So well. We can say that it was a big mis it was a big mistake to to continue mining for this year. I should have stopped. That's a matter of fact. I should have stopped. But okay, we've done it. I'm happy that I went through all this year. I've done this thing. I didn't want to give up. I gave up when I couldn't do. Well, I couldn't borrow money <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I got I got so indebted that we couldn't we couldn't continue anymore. But well, okay, it was a good experience. Yeah, it was a really good experience. So well, when you... everything everything is okay, I mean, when the economy is okay, when the market is okay, running running a large mining operation like this is profitable even today well before covid-19 pandemic <laughs> but running a big mining operation is profitable if you can give the best added value to a production it's even more safer it's uh, safer than the way i did it because i sold my production to inilakak so that was a really well, it wasn't the kind of the pitfall for me. I shouldn't have tried to, to give the best added value at the beginning of the, the operation, but well. So for me, the main, the main thing today is that it's, well, I don't want to make a big, large, very large mining operation. We know the deposit, what, our, what we planned was to launch in April, we wanted to launch a medium-sized mining with new techniques, not the same way, try to, to target the best, best place, the traps, because 
everything is about traps and other bird. Yeah. If you can manage these things, you can make a profitable operation. And so minimum of a burden, and you need to find a, a channel with stone that was not uh, mined before by people where you still have the gravel intact. You know what are the channels. We know what are the channels. This is yeah. not an issue. But we know what are, are the channels. That's, well, definitely it's not an issue. The main issue is, okay, how do you minimize your mining costs? Yeah. And also, the other issue today is how do you minimize the environmental damage? That's, <laughs> that's important today. Well, yesterday it wasn't, but today it is. So that, these are the, the main issue today. Mm. Yeah, still, you know the same thing. You need to understand the geology, the deposit. Well, with you, after 20 years mining there, you have a good understanding of that. Then you need to have the right mining engineering in order to make the mine uh, uh, cost efficient and uh, profitable. And then you need to uh, usually to deal with security, not to get stolen your production. And of course, you need to sell your production at a price that uh, basically cover your mining and plus some profit. So as you say, with uh, current days uh, price, you know, with COVID and things like that difficult, like in 2009, when you had this crisis, maybe a few months before when the price for pink were high, everything was okay. But suddenly in 2008, 2009, you had the political crisis in Madagascar. And then you had uh, this uh, financial crisis in the world and all your operation went to a kind of a financial problem because of issues that were out of your hand. So that's the whole uh, challenge miners have to do. And when you're planning a mine on five or six years, how can you know that in five years they will not, the economic situation will be good? So you have to take a lot of risk. That's true. And so just- Yeah, sure. And, uh, okay, go ahead. I was gonna, I was gonna ask, because we were seeing some of these pictures of your, of your mine and your process. So once you get to this point in the mining where you've got all these uh, sort of mountains of dirt, is it, this all then has to get washed or you know which one's to wash and which one is just junk? Junk of a burden. This mm -hmm. is the all of a burden. Okay. But then, you don't wash this thing. But then so once you get to the level of gravel where you know the stones are good, then you're, you're, you're sort of bringing them over to something like this. This is like a... Yeah. So the sorting and washing plant? Washing plant, yeah. Yeah. In this washing plant, we could wash about uh, 70 truck a day, this kind of truck. Mm, okay. So it's about 700, 700 cubic meters a day. Every day we wash this. Wow. We know exactly that we would get about two kilos, less than two kilos of sapphire every day. But what we didn't know is, we didn't know is how many big size stones yeah. you can get. Yeah. It's completely uh, well out of your out window. Of, not, we yeah. don't know. Yeah. And then this is this is in a different locality. No, this is the plant in Ansu. Okay. This is our, our washing plant in Ansu. Mm. Okay. Before we stop. And what about that one? That was in a vo in a uh, women. Well, this one is just a washing plant at the at the, the beginning of the two thousand. That the first washing plant that I I used. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, let's go over to some of the questions from the audience because I've been neglecting them them a little bit um okay here there's a few been a few questions about what other kinds of stones have you seen besides just um sapphires like for instance someone was specifically asking about have you seen substantial pieces of garnets or chrysoberyl or any other material like this sure yeah, sure, sure. A lot of garnet, but very well, small garnet, not good quality. 
once I get one, I got one uh, food, very nice color, special type, very nice, nice foreground, foreground one, but once in my whole mining life, <laughs> but very nice, very clean, very good shape. We produce also, we produced also some very nice chrysoberin. People are talking uh, about uh, Alexandrite. I have never, never got an uh, Alexandrite, but nice, very nice cat's eye. We got very, very nice cat's eye, big size cat's eye, about uh, uh, 70, 70 carats cat's eye, very nice. And blue sapphire and pink sapphire, but this is uh, a... Yeah. Then, then you have many other stones. In Ilakak, I think you have probably about 20 different uh, variety of gemstone. You have also spinels. You have also a lot of zircons. You have, uh, of course, uh, you have tourmaline a lot. Topaz. But not all the stones were seen by the miners as uh, profitable because the buyers... Uh, depending on the period, now it's more like uh, they are getting everything because there is a market for everything. But at the beginning, when uh, Nirin was going there, there was only market for sapphires and uh, maybe a uh, cat size on a chrysal, but the other stone were just rejected. But now there are, there are many, uh, yeah, about 20 different types of uh, gem material are found in the gravel in Idakak. Wow. And so somebody else had asked, once the stones are found and, you know, sorted and everything, is, as far as exporting goes, is there a legitimate process or is it sort of like smuggled out or how do the stones get out of Madagascar? No, the, the, well, it's very easy to, to send the stone abroad and the, the, while the procedure is very simple. You have to pay a certain amount, a percentage of the, 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 the amount you declare to the government. So it's very easy. You don't need to smuggle out the, the stone out of the country. There is no reason okay. you have to smuggle, yeah. And then another question was talking about, um, you know, after the mining, is there any facilities in Madagascar for cutting and heating or, or does all that stuff just get exported as rough and it gets treated, or I mean, processed somewhere else? There are some facilities, but you have to understand one thing that, the, uh, well, most of the blue, blue sapphire, Gouda has to be heat treated. And the best place to treat uh, sapphires is uh, Sri Lanka and Bangkok. So, well, some people are treating uh, pink sapphire. It's easy to treat pink sapphire. So they are doing this in Madagascar. There are a lot of facilities for um, cutting in uh, either in, well, I have a friend of mine who has a shop, a jewelry shop in, in Ilaka, who is cutting, the, very nice cutting. In Antananarive, there are some people, many people are cutting stones, but it's for a local and tourist market. Okay. But the main market for this quantity of supplies that we produce in Ilaka is uh, <laughs> the going other places you can find the market here is uh yeah in the, foreign countries. the main issue uh, justin is that there is no buyer for faceted stone in uh, in madagascar there is no for example jewelry company based in madagascar that will need thousands of uh, calibrated stone so if you are a sapphire cutter in madagascar who are you going to sell the stone to yeah the people buying a cut stone are mainly in Bangkok because in Bangkok you have all the jewelry factories. Yeah. So that's why many stone in pro gem producing country you have people coming to buy rough, but if you don't have people coming to buy cut, if you are a cutter, you compete with a rough buyer. But then you don't have the same market yeah. as uh, you have just maybe tourist or local market. Yeah. While, uh, you know, the professional buyer who are coming to Ilakak, number one, they have access to better uh, 
people for heat treatment. So they might sell the stone at better price because if the burner is efficient, he will get more money with the rough, so he can pay more for the rough. And if you have also, you know, uh, factories that are working with big brand and things like that, they will pay also higher price for the faceted stone. Yeah. So if you are a cutter in Madagascar, you you compete with the rough, you will have difficulty to get the good rough. And then you will have a market that will not be as good as the other one. So that's the difficulty. Yeah. You The key point is to attract the, the buyers. Yeah. And many buyers for faceted stone just don't go to Madagascar. Yeah. And I, they I, go to Sri Lanka or they go to Thailand. Yeah. I feel like that question has come up several times in previous talks in you know specifically in Africa and it seems like that's kind of pretty much the reoccurring hurdle that we speak about which is like you know many people think it's it would be a great idea to start a cutting factory you know in this country or that country but like you said if, if there's not a buying market there what are they going to do with the stones and there is another thing for example you cannot ship like uh, you know easy shipment if somebody is in Madagascar and want to sell a stone on the internet, it's very complicated. You cannot do it really from Madagascar. What you can do from a place like Bangkok or kind of not really from Sri Lanka, but you know, for, for a single cutter to work and he cut the stone and then he sells the stone on the internet like uh, people like uh, uh, are doing in a, in a developed country is very easy. You can be a cutter in the in the back of Australia, you get you rough, you yeah. cut the stone, and you sell to the, all the rest of the world. You can do that. But yeah. in Madagascar, how are you going to ship your stones? Yeah. And it kind of makes me think back to, you know, one of our first talks when we were talking to Chris Hood, who is kind of doing the same thing, right? He's got his own mine. He's got his own cutters. But because he's in, you know, he's in um, Tasmania and can sell to local people and Australian people, he he does have access to that other market, whereas I guess, and he can ship easily, whereas I guess in Madagascar, I guess there's not a there's not a UPS in every neighborhood. The there way is the no FedEx. Get. There is no FedEx in Madagascar. Yeah, so that's there is no be. FedEx. There is no uh, you. It's difficult. Yeah, and it, I guess it's kind of too bad because I I know many people like in some of the conferences that I w went to at the end of last year, you know many people are wanting to do more vertical integration inside of African countries, but if there's no way to get it, the stone or, or the jewelry or whatever it is to the customer, you know, some, there's going to have to be a big change in, in the way that the market works in order to, to be able to facilitate, you know, this sort of African vertical integration with cutting, heating, jewelry manufacturing, and then of course, shipping it or 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 having a market to to sell it at so it's kind of just an interesting a, a thought you know or it's interesting to see why that can't happen today the main difficulty for madagascar in that case is logistics the logistic for shipping the stone you just don't have it yeah and the banking thing and uh, you know all this uh, this is why somewhere bangkok is uh, very attractive because in Bangkok, you know, from a Bangkok uh, center, you can do everything. It's easy, you know, a, a shipment of goods to receive goods, payment and things like that. You have all these modernities that, uh, you know, that attracted uh, the trade because you can come, you can make your payment, you can, you have hotel to stay, you have good place to eat. You, you can do everything you, you need around basically the GM Tower and the GTC Tower. Everything is convenient there. But yeah. when you are in, uh, in Tana, when you are in Indaka, when you're in Tana and you see the traffic in Tana, it's killing you. Yeah. It's kind of complicated. It's much more complicated just based on that. Yeah. So, and if you are in Indaka, you know, Nirin is lucky because today we were discussing just before the talk, he was checking his internet connection and he was hoping the internet connection was, was okay. But actually, Ilakak, now Ilakak is quite okay. You have internet in Ilakak, but for how many years you have internet in Ilakak, you know? Four, four, five years. Yeah, four, five years. 
Oh, before that, no, uh, no selling on Instagram. Not possible. Even if you could ship, you couldn't post. Well, before that, there was many times there were poor cut. You know how regularly you have uh, suddenly it's not about do you have internet or no. There is no electricity. Yeah. So when there is no electricity, I can tell you there is a lot of things that in the uh, Western world we are thinking is normal that suddenly everything stop. And oh, no electricity, no TV, no computer, <laughs> no, nothing. <laughs> you take a pen, a paper, and a book. So, Niran, we, we've spoke about so far about four different mining localities that you've been around to and that Vincent's visited. Some, someone in the audience had asked, are there other major production areas right now, maybe ones that we haven't spoken about? Diego? Uh, for Sapphire, there was uh, Diego, but well, there are a few, few diggers out there. I don't know exactly what is the situation in Diego, uh, but I don't see any other <laughs> potential <laughs> areas anymore. I like a content dump on the lamen, that's all. Mm. Okay. And um, do you think, this is another question from the audience, do you think right now is Ilikak the best mining project like investment wise do you think that's this is the best locality for all of madagascar the best what please like the best investment like if you're going to start a new a new mining project for you is this the best place or is there an, you think there's <laughs> another locality that could be more interesting well i'm interested in two places ilakak and Andandam. Actually, I gathered a lot of the data uh, and the, non, the lack of deposit. But today, I don't see mining as a, as a livelihood. I don't think that, um, well, I don't want to get involved in big size mining anymore. Even if it's profitable, I don't want to do this kind of thing. Okay. We want to launch medium size mining, try new techniques. We have all, all the, not all the equipment and part of the equipment. We want it to begin in April this year, but due to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we, we didn't launch this mining. Now I'm making small, so small scale mining with uh, about 100 diggers. We want to to improve techniques. We are we want to to use this new well, new way of the mining. But uh, today, I don't see mining in Madagascar as a livelihood because well, you are becoming a Burmese. You are getting wise. <laughs> <laughs> No, just realistic. <laughs> the Burmese, the Burmese they, they, most of the miners, the big miners in Burma, they just don't have only mining. They have another business nearby because they know that some period for one year, two years, doesn't make sense about mining, but you have to continue to live and you cannot get bankrupt. So they have a vegetable thing. They have an agriculture project. A little bit like you are doing now because you have some uh, other business which well, but the challenge the challenge is that we well with with the, such a big deposit i think i'm I have the sentiment i'm still convinced that there is something to do there in the the outside there is a big safe we don't know how to, to we don't have the we don't know how to open this safe but we'll find the way to open the safe. We are just, there is so huge potential here. People can't imagine, but we don't know how to do. We'll find the way. And we are, this is the big challenge <laughs> today. <laughs> so what do you think for, for small scale mining? We, we talked a little bit about it before. You were saying sometimes the people are getting paid very low wages. But in general, do you think that the small scale mining is actually helping the people or is it, 
you know. They are not paid more wages, uh, Jesse. They have s- small revenue. Most of the time, they have no wages. Yeah, well, I know, but, but sometimes their revenue are, are very tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But either way, whether they're working for somebody or they're just there independently, is this is this type of mining actually helping the local people in terms of you know improving the livelihood, the the life uh, in general? Yeah, sure. Because there are, well, I think there are still, as I told before, there is Ilaq is about eighty thousand eighty thousand uh, inhabitants. There are more than in all this area. I think there is there are more than thirty to forty thousand people digging and working in the in the mines. So even if they are working in very tough conditions, they are there, and these people are in better situations than people in if they had stayed in their homeland. So well. Even though it's very difficult for, for them, it's better than what they know elsewhere. So mm-hmm. yes, it helps people. Okay. But it's not the ideal one. I think we can improve, really improve the way these people are working. But this is another story. Yeah. And uh, well, this is another story. <laughs> I don't get. <laughs> well, we we had one question from the audience, kind of related to that. Um, Mubashir Mansour had asked, "Do you think, or what? What's your thoughts, at least, about maybe different kinds of uh, policies from national groups or international organizations?" to try and make the life of miners easier, you know, like for providing education or safety equipment or supplies or something like that. Do you, th- what, what do you, what's your thoughts about that? Well, be, before we come to this, uh, to this level, we, there is one thing, the techniques, the, we the, the diggers use now is not are not well are not really efficient. This is my my sentiment. Mm-hmm. So before before helping the people, trying to find a way to help the people, maybe we have to work on the techniques, find the best techniques, find the best way to to be even at the small scale level to be profitable. This is, well, this is the first thing. When you find a way to be profitable at the small scale level, then okay, you can improve the, the, the working conditions, you can, well, safety conditions and everything. But before that, you, you have to, to understand that at the small scale le- level, this is not a profitable business. If you take Ilaka uh, as a whole enterprise, I mean, a whole entity, then you, see, you can say, wow, it's, uh, it's a profitable. I mean, all these 80,000 people working, uh, or 30,000 people working, it's uh, as a whole entity, then it continues to work, it's profitable. But at the sm- at the small scale level, I don't think it's profitable. Mm. That is there is a difference because we don't have the techniques, and we people just rely on luck. You cannot rely on luck if you want to set up a business model. You cannot rely on luck. Yeah. It's not possible. So and you uh, have the thing. You have one guy who found a, a good stone, and he will get a decent price. And then you have 20 guys who don't find anything or just find a, you know, a stone that they will barely be able to, uh, to sell and cover their cost. So when you look at the average, because you have one big stone and basically one guy will become rich, but you have 19 other guys who are basically barely able to make it. So you have a huge disparity. And as Nirin say, it's, you get a good stone, you get 
if, if there is one guy who found a, a good stone out of 1,000, there is one guy who get kind of rich, and there is 1,999 who are remaining at a subsistence level. Yeah. So on the average, it looks good, but actually there is a huge difference between the few guys who are lucky and most of the people who are not. So this is what I call the gym casino. In a, there are, everybody is looking at the winner. Oh, this guy, he was able to get a, a, a cat size 20 carat and he was able to get a car. He went back to his village and he bought uh, 200 cattle. So he's a model for all the young people in the village and many people around because, oh, he succeeded. But then you have all the other guys who were not able to be lucky. And luck is not a business plan, as I repeat many times. And yeah. this is what I see. I, I guess that this is what you mean, uh, Irene. It's luck is yeah, not... because this, is, this was always the same story in the mining business. The nugget bias. You ready? There is a nugget. Everyone sees the nugget. The big size stone. But no one looks at the, all the small, the small diggers who, don't, who are living in very, very harsh conditions. So, well, but they are the year better than they are in their homeland. So, well, yeah. it helps people to, to reply to your, but, to your question. So maybe reply, though, uh, based on what you said, it seems like though, if there was some educational system for training miners on mining techniques, that could be quite helpful for many of the artisanal miners from what you're saying, it seems like. You have to find the, the, the best mining techniques for small scale mining. Yeah. We didn't know. I have been in uh, Sri Lanka. I have been lead, I left, lead there for two months with uh, Sri Lankan diggers. I know how to the Sri Lankan style, uh, style of mining. I use these techniques in the uh, Lamen. I am the only one who master this. Uh, techniques from Sri Lanka because I'm under, I stayed with the people in the pit and but you cannot use these techniques in Madagascar, in Ilakak. You can use these techniques in uh, Dilemen because you have all the wood, the, all the fougere, and some, some spe yeah. very special plant that you, you can, yeah. you need to yeah. use all these techniques. But in Ilakak, you can, you don't have the wood, you don't have this uh, plant. So it's, uh, it's impossible to use these uh, techniques. So first of all, I say education comes with, if you know how to, to mine, so you can educate, the, give this education to the people. But if you don't know how, and yeah. we don't know yet how to do, yeah. this is uh, the main point. This is really the main, main issue. So maybe Just saying, you have to see that most of the companies that came, like the Thai company and the Sri Lankans that came with machine, and they were thinking they knew how to mine, they all went bankrupt. So then this model is not really a, yeah. is not really a winning model because they all stopped and because they failed. But so we, how to mine, you know, that's a nearing challenge, you know. Yeah. He basically, you, you went several times bankrupt, and you are still searching what is uh, uh, the model that will enable you to mine on the long run in a profitable way. That's not easy in a place like Ilakak, even if you have many stones. So maybe now uh, in this new, what, you know, whatever your next mining project is going to be, you're, you're, maybe you'll be able to figure that out. You're going to figure out the secret uh, that everyone's been looking for this whole time, the best, you know, the best way. Please, I don't. I didn't understand your. No, I'm just question. saying, uh, w with your next, with your next mining project, maybe now is you're going to figure out what that best way is. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, <Yeah>. but we <laughs> let it be my secret. <laughs> okay. Well, the thing is, well, the thing is, well, we. I don't want to make large mining operation. To set up large mining operation, it's uh, it's in, it's not in the in my mind. I want to. We have the knowledge of the deposit. We want to go to the the the, the traps because uh, as an alluvial deposit, 
stones are strapped somewhere. We know more or less how it happens, how it happened. So we want to go for the straps for many, as I told you, for many reasons, minimizing the cost, minimizing environmental damages. And we will try. We know how to, we all know we have the equipment to do this kind of thing. So, okay, let's, let's see each other after one or two years. Yeah. <laughs> so we spoke about so much already and, and, and really have gone through so much of your life experience with mining, but tell us a little bit right now about what's going on recently since COVID started and how has COVID affected the whole situation where you're at? Oh, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> for most, well, since this uh, COVID uh, pandemic, I'm, I think the price for even for the very nice stones has been div divided by three or by four. And prices for medium quality and low quality, it's, uh, that's, it's nothing. People are trying, I mean, diggers are trying to survive every day, every day. And it's, uh, well, it's a pity. Uh, security has peaked mm -hmm. since uh, two or uh, six, seven months, seven weeks from now, of uh, seven weeks now. And uh, it's, uh, well, disorder reigns in Ilakak, in the mining place and in Ilakaka town. It's really, really, well, it's not safe. Today, okay. it's not safe. Okay. The so main I'm, reason is the buyer left, correct? You, you don't have uh, so many people remaining to buy stone. So the price went down. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's, um, on, that's, that's correct. But on the other hand, the few people that, that stays, that remains in Ilaka, they don't know how to send the, the, the stones outside. And you know that there is the market everywhere is kind of trapped. And so the only people who buy stones is for speculation. They, own, they buy stones because it's cheap and they don't want to pay a high price for, for stones that they will keep maybe for free for one year, two years, three months, one year, two years. So, there's no point. I understand this. Uh, it's comprehensible. So I understand this, uh, these things. But the, the, the people who are suffering from this are the diggers. Because even with the well, their living conditions were uh, difficult before. But now with the COVID-19 COVID things, it's even, well, it's worse. It's worse. So there is no this more is money my... coming to this mining village. Basically, there is very few money going to this mining village. And in this mining village, there is nothing to eat. So how people are surviving there? I don't know how they do. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> okay. So have you been kind of just staying home since February or so? Or, or have you been out to the mining areas since then? No, no, I'm, I'm working about uh, 30 kilometers from Milaga. I go to my mine almost every day. Not every day, but every once every two days. So every while well, we have people that do mining. So we, uh, we continue our mining as before. Well, so You have enough capital to keep mining for a while. That's the thing. Well, the thing is, I don't, well, I don't rely on mining to to live. I have some, well, some other businesses, so okay. Well, we can continue to work for yeah. a couple of months. <laughs> yeah, see what you become a Burmese. You become like a Burmese. You you get the wisdom, <laughs> the Burmese wisdom, where most of the miners in Burma they have another business nearby because they say, you know. Uh, uh, a chicken is advancing better with two legs, like people. So if you just put everything in mining, then you may have a problem when for a period of time, mining uh, has problems. So it's better to have two or three business if 
So you can uh, put one into uh, rest and you still have the two other one to keep going. Yeah. That's the way of the bummies. So Niran, I think maybe this is my last question of the evening for you. We, we've heard the ups, the downs, all these different uh, experiences that you've had, but obviously you, you haven't lost the dream. You still have the, the thirst to find new stones. So um, for you, what, what's, what's the dream like now? What's the really attractive part of, of continuing to be a, a gemstone miner? <laughs> that's uh <laughs> well that's a question uh, well maybe well let's say maybe it's greed maybe it's stupidity <laughs> <laughs> you know you 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 get the virus you get the mining virus uh, and it's a kind of disease that is difficult to uh to, to, to get rid of. I think it's an addiction somewhere. I think it's just well, an addiction. Well, it's, uh, it's a real addiction. And, but, well, the main thing is that there is, there is a potential. There is things I, well, had the sentiment that uh, we can find a way to make a profitable business from mining in Ilakak. Up to now, this not this is not the case. But well, mining I don't know mining elsewhere, but mining in Madagascar is uh well it's not like it's unlike most other jobs, really. <laughs> in, the, and, that is, and here in, the place is just beautiful when you are at the mine near Voimen or near Ansu and you wake up in the morning and you see this sky. And you see the landscape around you, and you you are in a fresh air, and you see the whole place. And, and at night, when you see all these stars, Ilakak is nice. You know, you feel it, it's a nice place. Well, it's a nice place, and mining is uh, really it's uh, for me. It's a wonderful job. It's uh, it's freedom, but. Okay, it's there. There are a lot. Well, there are the knowns. There are the things you know. There are things I know. I know the equipment. I know part of the deposit. But when you come to really the reality of mining, there are so many things you cannot control things that are this completely out of uh, out of the things you have foreseen so this you have to make every day of mining is a challenge every day every single day of mining is a big challenge you have to while well, you, you try you have to you try to make the best decision with the things you know and the things you don't know, the things you guess. And this is a real challenge when you master a lot of these things. Well, you're happy. It keeps me passionate. <laughs> that's that's all. When you when you do some of the other jobs, and well, four years ago we I launched um a business in a uh, animal feed. We are we are buying byproducts from the breweries, mm -hmm. and uh, we we well this is spent grain and uh, yeast, and we dry these uh, byproducts and we sell it to the anim uh, animal feed uh, industry. Well. These these are things you can manage to understand within one week, two weeks. You can control. There is no unknown. You manage everything. You know everything. We, in a couple of months, everything is under control because I am used to to deal with very difficult things in mining, and so when I shift to other business it's so well it's easy and 
this is this is why I'm still here. I want to well, <laughs> well I want to understand. You, all you are an engineer. You love problem. You, you, you <laughs> love to have problem to solve because you are an engineer and you like engineering issues. So you are in the mind, and every day you have a different challenge, and you never get bored. While in the other job, you are getting bored yeah, because sure. you don't have any challenge in the jobs. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. the only thing that keeps me yeah in here in Iraq. Cool. <laughs> But anyway, we'll find it. We'll find the way. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. I mean, it seems like you have a lot of experience to draw from, and it sounds like you still have a lot of ideas that you want to try. So I hope it works. I really... Yeah, and uh, Justin, you might be able to see that because maybe next time I take you to uh, Madagascar with me yeah, and I, I you will go to spend some time at uh, Nirin Mine. And, uh, and then it will be even different because we will be there together, all three, and Nirin will explain us showing the, you know, showing the channel and showing the machine and And we'll have a great discussion about that, but just, you know, uh, at the mine, yeah, watching no. the whole thing. And then we'll go to visit all the place where he mined. And then I will show, oh, Nirin was mining here. And then Nirin was mining there. And then <laughs> I love to do that. I, I love to go to all the place where Nirin worked and uh, listen to him telling me the story of uh, what he did and how he did this place and why he succeeded and why he failed. Learn a lot with Nirin. He's uh, my uh, uh, Madagascar uh, mining master. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm very happy to have been able to not yet, uh, not yet. meet him on a. Yeah, well, yeah, I learned most of the thing about mining in Madagascar after the discussion we had together in Madagascar and the discussion we had together in Bangkok when we were looking at Google Earth together, looking at oh, you remember that? <laughs> that was fun. That's well, Niran, thank you so much for all of the, the good knowledge that you've given to us tonight and the stories and the photos. It's been a, yeah, I'm definitely really want to come. You know, it looks like a beautiful place, interesting place, obviously lots of different things to see. So hopefully, yeah, once all the virus and everything is over and the borders are open again, me, I can uh, tag along with Vincent next time that we come or next time you come. So uh, let me put up our final screen and uh, and um, we'll just say thank you again to Niran and thank you to all of the guests who have, you know, spent so many weeks with us now and, and just keep coming back for more knowledge and more stories and more adventures while we're all stuck doing whatever we're doing. So, yeah, thank you guys. And, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, keep going, sorry. I, no, I don't know. I had nothing else to say. You know, uh, Niran is not really doing social media, so uh, um, if you want to get a hold of him, you just have to fly there, I guess, or you or get a hold of Vincent and uh, and uh, whatever. If you guys want to, if you're not following us already, uh, here's all the info. And of course, this video along with uh, previous videos are all going up on Vincent's YouTube channel. So if you missed one or you want to watch one again, they're all there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, no, Vincent, not yet. the one from last week is not yet online. Well, they're coming along yeah. as they come along. Pretty really soon. And so, Vincent, what are we, what are we looking forward to next week? Who are we going to talk to? Well, next week we are leaving Africa for a short period, and we are going to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, we are going to have a discussion with my old friend, uh, Doctor Pham Van Long. So he's a geologist. He has uh, he did his PhD on uh, the Germany area in. Uh, Uh, Lukien, Lukien area, but he also studied uh, Quicho and the sapphire deposit in the south. So we are going to speak about the different gem uh, producing areas in Vietnam. Cool. That will be uh, very interesting, yeah. quite different, but uh, very interesting, I think. Also. Yeah, we haven't spoken to anyone in Vietnam yet, so that's kind of a, maybe it'll be refreshing from so much Africa. Yeah, well, the difficulty is a bit the same as with, uh, for example, Nirin is uh, long, Doesn't, he's not really uh, speaking too much. And it's difficult in Vietnam to find people who can speak English or, or French. So most of the, my contact in Vietnam, uh, miners and things like that, they, they are speaking Vietnamese. Okay. And this is one of the main issues when you want to speak, for example, with miners, 
you don't find everywhere somebody like Nirin who can speak uh, English, French, who have an engineer degree, uh, you know, from uh, one of the best engineer school in, uh, in Europe. You don't find this type of minor everywhere. So sometimes it's uh, kind of difficult to have uh, communication with, with yeah. people. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess we got to give Niren another thanks for that, for being such a unique, um, a unique minor to let us have the ability to get inside of your brain and your experience because we can share the language. So that's, that's lucky for us. So thank you again for uh, being able to come on here and tell us all this good stuff. Okay, bye. Okay, thank so you. yeah, we'll thank see you guys. You. And thanks uh, everybody to have uh, uh, listened to us uh, this time again. And I thanks also all the people who will watch us on uh, YouTube in the next uh, few uh, weeks, uh, maybe years. Okay. So see you. Thanks, uh, Justin, to have been a, a great uh, MC one more time. And uh, hopefully, Nirin, uh, I will see you next time in uh, Madagascar again, and we'll enjoy another visit to this uh, great place. Take care and uh, good luck. And uh, I wish you to find a, a, a nice big stone tomorrow in order to celebrate your first time on a, <laughs> on a webinar. <laughs> See you, Nirin. Uh, Thanks a lot. Yes. And Vincent, I'll see you next Wednesday, same time or about. Yes. See you. Bye, everybody.